So, Prime Minister, questions yesterday. I, I would normally release this um, video on a Wednesday, but I was uh, tied up in a hospital yesterday doing tests. And I must say, I, I was quite exhausted as a result. Um, I came back home and had to do some lessons, uh, w w which was rather like clawing through jelly. It was exhausting in, in, its, in, in and of itself. And uh, normally I'm up by about six o'clock in the morning and perky and functioning and reading newspapers and stuff. And this morning I, <laughs> again, I overslept. So I'm feeling a little... A little sheepish, meh, but um, but nevertheless, uh, here, here we are. I'm tidying up the stuff that I should have done yesterday. So PMQs, um, Rishi Sunak challenged, uh, the big thing, Rishi Sunak challenged Keir Starmer over Labour's decision to cut winter fuel allowances for everybody but the poorest pensioners in England and Wales. And Sunak pressed Starmer to release an impact assessment of the policy which is expected to reduce the number of recipients from 11.4 million to 1.5 million, saving one billion pounds. That's quite significant, particularly when uh, Starmer claims that Sunak left a 22 billion pound black hole in the finances. So um, one billion saved every year will be a significant um, help to sorting out the economic mess. Now, of course, that 22 billion black hole wouldn't become evident until 2028. Um, and, and, that, and that's one of the bits of information which the Labour Party slightly elides over. And uh, so it's a projection even, even in itself. And, uh, and, and that's one reason why Jeremy Hunt can look a little bit shocked and there's a nice cutaway to Jeremy Hunt at one point in in the proceedings today. Jeremy Hunt can look a little bit shocked, uh, a little bit taken aback about the claim of fiscal mismanagement because mm, it's a little bit of a um, it's a little bit of an exaggeration. But I mean, what is not an exaggeration at all is the fact that the Conservative Party had, uh, I think, not 14 years of chaos, but certainly seven to eight years of chaos following Brexit and following an introspective, so, uh, self-obsessed and, um, and a certainly obsessive interest in immigration and aggressive policies uh, r rather than sorting out um, the, the, the mess that had been created by Brexit. Um, so even if they thought that Brexit could work, Instead of instead of making it work, they focused on minutiae that that, that, that that were not going to help ordinary people at all. What we needed was a government which was going to help business to adjust to the new reality. Uh, um, what we needed was a was a government that would have help would help to bridge the gap for universities and educational institutions to adjust. And what we got was self-obsession and a government which is more interested in who was, who was in charge than serving the people. So, I, you know, I think there's every reason to excoriate the Conservatives and I'm there backing up Carol Vorderman, I suppose, um, who is publishing a book, I think, this morning um, and is, is very gleeful about that. Um, and she points out the BBC has, has behaved much the same as the, as the last government, too self-obsessed, too more interested in its authority, uh, hence its social media edicts, which um, impinge on personal space and, 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 and the, the right to a personal private life that an employee has. The, the employer does not own the person who works for them. And and Carol Vorderman is absolutely right in that assessment and um, took one for the team, of course, being sacked by the BBC. Starmer defended the policy about pensioners, citing the Conservatives' fiscal mismanagement and the need for economic stability. And he also argued that the rise in state pensions driven by the triple lock would offset the cut to winter fuel allowances. Now, we'll see more about that in the budget, and that may be 
one of these um, bits of uh, theatrical politics, um, sleight of hand, and the um, so, so, so the alarm driven now by the removal of the pension to be replaced by the relief when it's uh, when that money is effectively returned. Uh, during the budget. Now, I imagine that's what's going to happen, but at the moment, you know, we hold our breath and what, uh, and, and it looks very bad. Um, Sunak accused Starmer of withholding vital information about the winter, about the policy's potential impact, referencing previous Labour research that warned of potential deaths due to such a policy. And the government indicated that a statistical publication on fuel poverty impacts will be released in the future though it remains unclear whether an official impact assessment has so far been conducted, and charities have raised concerns about the policy driving more pensioners into poverty. So let's have a look at the actual Prime Minister questions. I'll, in, I'll interject where I think it's necessary. Uh, and meanwhile, I, I'd also point out to you the other interesting thing is Nigel Farage's comments. Uh, and I think Farage wasn't anticipating the barrage of... Of, um, of, of of vocal uh, dismay when he mentioned the um, two-tier policing, two-tier justice, which he could barely get out. And um, Keir Starmer was very dismissive of the question. But I think that that, that noise was, was, was not obeying simply from one side of the house. It came from all sides of the house. That was quite extraordinary noise. Um, and Mr. Farage is going to have to steal himself um, or he's going to have to recognise that he's got to trim his rhetoric because it, would, it doesn't go down well in the House of Commons, in the current House of Commons. We now come to Prime Minister's questions. Torsten Bell. Yeah. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This weekend we remembered the late Queen and her enduring legacy of service and devotion to our country. And I was proud to announce a new national monument located at St James's Park to honour her memory. Yeah. And I know the whole House will join me in sending our best wishes to the Princess of Wales as she completes her treatment. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this afternoon we'll introduce the Renters' Rights Bill. Yeah. After years of inaction, yeah. this Government will oversee the biggest levelling up of renters' rights in a generation, and I urge the whole House to get behind it. And later this week, I'll visit Washington to meet President Biden for a strategic discussion on foreign policy. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in the House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Torsten Bell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Back in the 1990s, the Conservatives claimed that the minimum wage would cost one million jobs. Instead, low earners have seen the fastest pay rises year after year, with no effect on employment year after year, which they oppose. Today, and under their watch, one million workers are on zero hours contracts, and over a million people, over a million people have no sick pay whatsoever, facing risks that nobody in this House would bear. The details matter, but it is outdated nonsense. Or odd. So please sit. One, it's easier if you face me, I can hear it better. But the second part is it's meant to be a question, not a statement. Yeah. Uh, no, I decide, Prime Minister. Don't I? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, economic growth is our number one mission, um, and that's why we forged a new positive relationship with business. But too many people are insecure at work, and that holds them back and holds our economy back. This government was elected to deliver for working people, and that is exactly what we will do. We come to the Leader of the Opposition, Rishi Sunak. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister in his words about Her Late Majesty the Queen, but also in his words about the Princess of Wales? Uh, she has been in the thoughts of everyone across the country, and I know everyone in the House will be delighted and relieved at the progress that she has made. Uh, may I also, Mr Speaker, take this opportunity uh, to pay tribute to Nicholas Howard. This is his last Prime Minister's questions after supporting eight consecutive Prime Ministers through these sessions. Never my favourite part of the week, but his commendable service made it far more manageable. Yeah. 
Mr Speaker, yesterday Labour MPs voted to remove the winter fuel payment from over 10 million British pensioners, including those with just £13,000 of income. With that decision debated and made, it is now important that the House understands the full consequences of the Government's choice. So can I very specifically ask the Prime Minister, will he now publish the impact assessment before the House rises? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the fact of the matter is this. They left a £22 billion black hole and they hid it from the OBR. Richard Hughes is absolutely clear it's the largest year ahead overspend outside of the pandemic. Now, of course, when it comes to mitigations and impacts, we put those in place, ramping up pension credit, dealing with housing benefit and linking it, something the party opposite didn't do for years. And because of the tough decisions that we're making to stabilise the economy, we can make sure that the triple lock shows that increases in pensions will outstrip any loss of payments. But before, before he complains about us clearing up his mess, Perhaps he'd like to apologise for the £22 billion black hole. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, this has got... Mr Speaker... I want to hear the question. Mr Speaker, when I was in government, I delivered record increases in the state pension. We protected the winter fuel payment and we gave pensioners cost of living benefits. He's the one that's taking money away from pensioners on £13,000, Mr Speaker. But this has got nothing to do with the public finances. His own Chancellor, his own Chancellor just this morning, his MPs may not have been listening to her, his own Chancellor this morning admitted that she would prefer it if this policy didn't even raise any money, Mr Speaker. Obviously, the Government would not have made this decision without an impact analysis. And yesterday, the Energy Minister confirmed that. So I ask, very simply again, why won't he publish the assessment now? Mr Speaker, I I remember the days when the Conservative Party was to to be concerned about balancing the books. They've left a £22 billion black hole. Responsibility for this decision lies there. The only way to rebuild our country and invest in our public services and make sure everyone is better off is if we clear up their mess and deal with the 22 billion black hole. But, Mr Speaker, last week we learned that the Shadow Housing Secretary was calling for means testing of winter fuel payments. Now it turns out, now it turns out that the Shadow Paymaster General agrees with her and even boasted about texting his own mother saying she didn't need the payment. Until he apologises for the mess they've created, he's no position to criticise the action that we're taking. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, they're shouting now, but those arguments didn't even convince 50 of his own MPs, who suddenly found that they had urgent business elsewhere yesterday, Mr Speaker. But we know why he's hiding the impact assessment. The Labour Party's own previous analysis claimed that this policy could cause 3,850 deaths. So are the numbers in his impact assessment higher or lower than that? Mr Mr. Speaker, we're taking this decision to stabilise the economy. That means we can commit to the triple lock. By committing to the triple lock, we can make sure that payments of state pension are higher and therefore there's more money in the pocket of pensioners, notwithstanding the tough action that we need to take. But he goes around pretending that everything's fine. That's the argument he tried in the election. And that's why he's sitting there and we are sitting here. Mr Speaker, today pensioners watching will have seen that the Prime Minister has repeatedly refused to admit or to publish the consequences of his decision, and we will continue holding him account for that. But changing changing topics, Mr Speaker, today is back British Farming Day, where we recognise that British farmers produce food that is higher quality, has higher welfare standards and higher environmental standards than imported food. And at a time of increasing global volatility, they are also crucial for our food security and national security. Can he therefore confirm, therefore, whether he will be adopting the NFU's recent proposal to enshrine a national food security target in law? 
Prime Minister. Well, uh, food security is really important. I'm glad he's raised that. We have talked to the NFU uh, about this, and rural issues are really important, and that's what we fought the election on, where we've got a lot of rural constituencies sitting behind me now. We continue to talk to the NFU. We do take food security very, very seriously. Mr. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I did hear a specific answer, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, but, but farmers also do great work to preserve the beauty of the British countryside, and something I'm sure that the Prime Minister will appreciate, given his newfound preference for landscapes over political portraiture. (laughs) But when it comes comes to land use, when it comes to land use, there are currently protections in place to ensure that the most productive farmland is used for food production rather than alternatives like solar. So does he agree that it is not appropriate or right that developers with a vested interest, grade the quality of that farmland themselves? And will he look at making that process independent? Mr Speaker, rural communities were neglected under the last government. Confidence confidence was at an all-time low, uh, and thousands of food and farming businesses have been forced out of business. Now, of course, we will work with them. Of course, we'll get the balance right, but we are again picking up clearing up the mess and rebuilding our country. Mr Mr. Speaker, as a glimpse, in Wales, the Labour government hammered farmers, hitting them with top-down eco-targets, and Labour's own assessment of those plans said that it would lead to thousands of job losses, less food security and destroy rural incomes, while farmers described it as bleak and damaging. So can he reassure English farmers that he won't threaten their livelihoods, and can he rule out imposing those same top-down targets here? Prime Minister. We will work with farmers across the whole of the United Kingdom, as we've made clear to support them. But here we are, absolutely clear, no contrition, no responsibility for the economic black hole, the broken NHS, the prison crisis, the ruinous legacy of 14 years of failure. We've started rebuilding the country, renters reform, house building, GB Energy, National Wealth Fund, Border Security Command, I could go on, whilst they try to rewrite history. We're getting on with building a better country for the future. I was surprised by the uh, by, by, by A, the tone and the efficiency of uh, Rishi Sunak, for the most part, um, and uh, and and not surprised greatly by Sunak's approach. Um, Sunak is focused on the public finances, uh, as he uh, as he was focused the other day when he was talking to the TUC, and I think he's also gearing up for uh, Lord Darcy's report today on the NHS, which is due, and um, and and in many ways he's repeating the same trope that Cameron. Uh, took in 2015 uh, with Greg Hans uh, taking also about the note um, from Liam Burns, I think, uh, about we've got no money left. Um, and, 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 and there isn't a lot of time in a parliamentary session to, to, to hanker down and get things done. So Keir Starmer is taking the view that he's got to get things done now, and he's got to set a tough image so he can lighten up later on. Um, and, uh, and, and and this will create, this will generate some very nasty headlines in, for example, the Mail and the Telegraph. Boris Johnson was terrified of these headlines. Um, but Keir Starmer doesn't seem to give a damn. And today there was a, or yesterday there was a headline about the prisons blaming Starmer. Um, But of course, that may well explain why Rishi Sunak didn't raise this issue, because really, this is something that Rishi Sunak should have done during his time. And he bottled out. So Starmer was forced to let people out of prison early. It's not something uh, that that is exclusive to this government. It's been done before by Conservative governments, by Labour governments. And uh, the right wing newspapers are, of course, delighted to be able to poking, to be able to poke fun at Starmer over this, um, and it's not so much the uh, the sales of newspapers which matters. 
It's the screaming headlines in the garage forecourt, which can be seen by anybody filling up their car. And Boris was nervous about that. Uh, Rishi Sunak may have been nervous about that. Keir Starmer, quite rightly, doesn't give a damn. And I'm delighted from that point of view. He's not going to rely on what's on the front pages. Well, I don't think he can rely on what's on the front pages because the front pages are never going to be kind to him. The front pages and the newspapers are run by people who are not behoven to the um, Labour Party. And um, Keir, Keir was quite happy to risk the prison story. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, he's, and he's similarly quite happy to risk the pensioners' stories and to risk the 52 Labour MPs who abstained from the winter fuel vote for one reason or another. What is more surprising about this opening part of the Prime Minister's questions was Rishi Sunak's uh, introduction of British farming um, on a day with, I think it's British Farming Day, uh, which is why everyone was wearing their bit of wheat. Um, and the day before was World Suicide Day, and the British Farming Day seems to have eclipsed World Suicide Day. Uh, it was very interesting that on World Suicide Day we got the report on the Jeremy Kyle issue and nobody seemed to be mentioning that. Um, but for Rishi Sunak, maybe this is a target to, 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 to hit with a mind to what's going to happen as he retires to the back benches. This is his last time on Prime Minister's Questions and he, of course, has a, constitu has, has a rural constituency in North Yorkshire. And, uh, and and so, therefore, that may explain why he raises the farmer's issue rather than the prison issue. Or maybe he's just afraid to raise the prison issue because he knows in the end that will be hit back to him and he um, Keir Starmer will be well primed and well ready to say, well, this was a problem waiting on your watch and you did nothing, nothing about it. I have taken the harsh decisions, the firm decisions that you should have taken, you know. I, I think um, I think that's real oh, politics, don't you? Uh, thank you, on. Mr. Speaker. I'm sure the whole House will firstly join me in paying our respects to Lieutenant Rod <coughs> Rodri Lyshen, who tragically passed away last week. My thoughts yeah. are with the family, loved ones, HMS Queen Elizabeth crew during this very difficult time. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, housing in Portsmouth is in dire straits. But local residents in Ports of North have valid concerns around population density, infrastructure and the environment. So I'm glad this government is working on delivering affordable housing in the city. Can the Prime Minister ensure that the infrastructure is properly considered and that communities are involved in the planning process for any new developments? Can I start by saying I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in sending condolences to the family of Lieutenant Lyshon. I agree with her on the desperate need for affordable housing, and that's why we're going to deliver the biggest social and affording housing uplift in a generation. We will get Britain building again 1.5 million houses because the dream of home ownership was snuffed out under the last government. We now come to the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Red Davy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself and my party with the comments made earlier by the Prime Minister about our amazing late Queen and also join him in sending our best wishes to Her Royal Highness, uh, Princess of Wales? I don't think anyone could have been, not been moved by her powerful video and we hope that she'll make a full and speedy recovery. Yeah. When it comes to fighting cancer, we know all too well that every day counts. But in the last year of the last government, there were over 100,000 patients waiting more than two months just to start their urgent cancer treatment, the worst uh, on record. So will the Prime Minister help boost cancer survival rates by guaranteeing that every patient can start their cancer treatment within 62 days? Well, I thank him for that question on a really important issue, and there's a report out by Lord Darcy tomorrow which will set out in stark terms the failure in terms of cancer treatment under the last government, which is a really serious issue. This timeline matters, which is why we're taking steps straight away 
to make sure that we can comply with that timeline because lives depend on it. And that's why we've already uh, taken a decision to put more scanners in to catch this early and use technology. It's a very serious issue, a very, very serious failure by the last government. So, Ed David. Prime Minister, for answer and always you look at the plans that the government is putting forward. Last night, Liberal Democrats voted against the withdrawing of winter fuel payments. We believe it's just wrong uh, to balance the books by removing the support from pensioners. But we do understand that there are some difficult choices to be made to clear up the appalling financial mess left by the last Conservative government. One of the many reasons for that mess was the Conservatives prioritising tax cuts for the big banks, costing £4 billion pounds a year. They pay more tax. They pay more so, tax. will the Prime Minister instead reverse those cuts so that we can afford to support millions of struggling pensioners through this very hard winter? Well, I'll resist the temptation to get ahead of the uh, budget, but look, what is important is that we recognise that there is this 22 billion black hole that's been left by the previous government. Now, I know that their practice, their practice to was ignore it, to pick it into long grass, we're taking the tough decisions because I'm absolutely convinced that's the only way we can start rebuilding our country, investing in our public services, and making sure that everybody is better off. Patrick Hurley. Speaker. My South Cork constituency has experienced a difficult summer. Firstly, I want to reiterate that our thoughts are with the families of Alice, Bibi and Elsie, who yeah. tragically lost their lives in the attack in July. I welcomed the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary to our town in the weeks that followed, and we worked together to find further ways to bring our community together. Can I therefore ask the, ask the Prime Minister to take this opportunity to recommit the government's support for our town for those grieving and affected by the tragic attack. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, I thank him for that question. and We stand with those who tragically lost their loved ones in this heinous attack. I didn't go up to Southport the day after uh, and went back actually three days after that on a private visit to meet some of the first responders who had been at the scene. Um, and simply to say thank you to them. I can't tell the House how angry I was when I got back to London and saw that those same officers who had responded were having things thrown at them by far-right thugs. Mr Speaker, we will work tirelessly to support his constituents, and I, can I thank him as well for his hard work in this difficult time, working with Sefton Borough Council and Liverpool City Region Combined Authority to deliver a support package. A community has endured this horrendous event should be supported, and I know will be, across the whole House. Yeah. Yeah. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday we witnessed some extraordinary celebratory scenes outside Britain's prisons, where in some cases serious career criminals were released. And this to make way for, yes, rioters, but equally those who've said unpleasant things on Facebook and elsewhere on social media. <laughs> Does the Prime Minister understand there is a growing feeling of anger in this country that we are living through two-tier policing and a two-tier justice system? I'm angry to be put in a position of having to release people who should be in prison because the last government broke the prison system. And the Prime Minister was repeatedly warned. He had his own release scheme. He was repeatedly warned that he had to adopt the scheme that we put in place. The former Justice Minister said, if we don't do it, we'll have to get down on our knees and pray. The p police chiefs made it absolutely clear in a letter to him before the election that he needed to take action, saying that they wouldn't be able to discharge their duties and saying the risk was loss of an ability to detain suspects. That means, Mr Speaker, an inability to arrest people committing offences. That's how bad it was. And they warned uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition that further delays until after the general election will increase the risk significantly. What did he do? He delayed and increased the risks. This is quite an extraordinary intervention by Farage because it demonstrates very clearly how utterly ineffective, useless and what an oversight Farage has become.
Because instead of answering Farage, uh, Starmer just assumes the question is about Rishi Sunak and the last government. He's got these slogans, fix the foundations, broke Britain, 22 billion, of which I think broke Britain is probably going to be the one that sticks. Fixing the foundations is all about his responsibility and no government really likes to be held to its own responsibility. Broken Britain is something that can last for years. And uh, and the idea of change, well, he's got to start deli delivering that and change. Uh, at the moment, that's interpreted as the hard decisions uh, and an opportunity for him to uh, establish his authority over his own party and to get across the idea that he's prepared to do things which are not um, which are not going to command helpful headlines the following day. Well, he's recognised, and Sue Gray probably has recognised, he's never going to have those helpful headlines. Uh, but he does need to start delivering solutions. So he's biting the bullet there. Um, but he, And he needs to start sorting out the problems from prisons to hospitals. And g good goodness, I... Um, I've, I, I've, I've, I, I, I'm in the middle of some cancer tests at the moment. It's quite scary, but um, ha ha having had a bit of a um, crisis during the summer about six weeks ago, and only now I've started to get to some of the tests, which should be routine. Um, and uh, and maybe I should say after six weeks I'm lucky. Uh, but I I learn that the that the scanner in the hospital that I've got to use. Um, isn't working, so I'm being transferred to another hospital um, and another delay before I can get that. Um, and, uh, you know, the Keir Starmer needs to sort this out because we can't deliver a health service where, where, where the infrastructure is lacking uh, he needs to look at the potential for growth. He needs to look at workers' rights. He needs to look at growing the economy. All these things that he talked about in the election period, he needs to start delivering. Uh, Rishi Sunak, as as we finish with a with, with a cutaway to Rishi Sunak, there, I think it's perfectly reasonable to go back to talking about what Sunak was saying. He talked about the three thousand eight hundred and fifty deaths potentially. So he's done his. He's done his work on the impact of the uh, pensioners' freeze. Uh, Keir Starmer doesn't want to release those figures and doesn't want to admit that any work has been done about it. Um, and I, I, th I, th I think that I think that was quite quite important. Uh, and the joke about the portrait to the landscape. Um, with the farming, may, maybe the whole point about talk about uh, wasting two questions on farming or contributing two questions on farming. I don't think any questions about farming are really wasted. Farming is a very important part of our national um, identity, let alone our product. Um, and we don't we don't give enough time to farming. Um, so it's so so it's probably to be recommended that that time is dedicated to farming. But I'm not sure these were the questions that would really. Re, re, that would really help. I think possibly that the questions were um, predicated by the joke about the portraiture and Starmer's um, choice of painting in his office and his defenestration of Mrs. Thatcher. That's a defenestration um, in a way that um, probably is a slight, um, slight modification on the way Putin does it, but um, it is a defenestration nevertheless. And uh, And then we come to more statistics with Farage citing the 1,750 people released uh, on early release and, uh, and and he talks about Starmer's ability to manage prisons especially uh, after what what he called the, the, the social media fueled riots um, he talks about the growing feeling of anger in this country um, and we're living through two-tier policing and two-tier justice. Um, I, I think, um, again, Farage thinks that he's on to a sure winner with his slogans there, but uh, I, I, I think he wasn't expecting Starmer to completely ignore him. And... Um, 
and, 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 and Starmer simply talks about the failures of the previous government. Uh, Farage must be feeling very foolish indeed. Um, uh, and particularly as Farage uh, contributed in so much to the, to, to the surge in the riots uh, with his with, 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 with his pointed questions, uh, it is a demonstration that the questions when he's actually got a chance to raise them were insignificant and overlooked. I welcome the government's swift action to bring railways pack back into public ownership. Great British Railways will deliver much needed reform, ensuring the network serves both passengers and rail freight effectively. So can the Prime Minister explain how Labour's ambitious railway plan will also deliver improvements to rail infrastructure to ensure my constituents get the service they deserve at Luton Station? Prime Minister. Well, I thank her for raising that important uh, matter. One of the first bills that we introduced was to reform our railways after 14 years of chaos. Great British Railways will unite track and train under a single leadership, and that means closer collaboration across the industry and faster, more effective decisions on critical infrastructure. And I know uh, how vital that will be in relation to both Luton and Leegrave stations in her constituency. We're carefully considering the best approach, uh, but I can assure her we're committed to ensuring our railways will be open to everyone. Tessa Mount. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today is back British Farming Day. The previous government let our farmers down and, in their incompetence, underspent the farming budget by £100 million. Mm. Will the Prime Minister deny rumours that his government plans to take advantage of the Conservatives' failure by removing that £100 million permanently? Farmers across the country want to know that the Prime Minister will increase the agriculture budget, as the Lib Dem manifesto proposed to speed up the rollout of the new environmental land man management schemes to support profitable, sustainable and nature-friendly farming. Yeah. Well, I thank you for that question. It is a really important issue, and our rural communities were neglected by the previous government, and that's why confidence is at an all-time low. And what we will do is to protect farmers from being undercut in trade deals, make the supply chain work more fairly, and prevent shop rises in bills by switching to GB Energy. We won't preempt the budget in relation to this, but we will put the support in place. Thank you. Luke Murphy. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. Many of my constituents, including those at Chapel Gate, have told me about the so-called management agents who charge them rip-off service fees mm. and then fail to provide even the most basic of maintenance. Yeah. Many of them spend hours each week battling with these agents just to ensure that they and their neighbours are not fleeced in their own homes. Will the Prime Minister recommit this government to act where the previous government failed to reform the leasehold system, which is archaic, outdated and feudal? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, can I first welcome the first ever Labour MP for Basingstoke. Yeah. And yes, we will reiterate our commitment to act to bring the feudal leasehold system to an end and ensure leaseholders can benefit from more rights, power and protections over their homes. Yeah. Mr Speaker, international law is clear. Dropping £2,000 bombs on densely populated civilian areas is a crime. And it's beyond dispute that Israel has used F-35s to do exactly that. Yet the government has chosen to exempt F-35 components from the arms license suspension, when all it had to do was say that Israel could not be the end user if UK manufactured parts were included. Last week, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister stood at that dispatch box and he said, we either comply with international law or we do not. Uh, right. Why has he chosen not to? Prime Minister. We are complying with international law. We've set out our reasoning, and I think all fair-minded members of the House would support the decision that we've taken. The most important thing now is that we get a ceasefire in place. That is one of the topics that I'll be discussing on Friday to ensure that the remaining hostages uh, can come out, that aid that's desperately needed can go in, and we can start the process to a two-state solution, which is the only way to lasting peace. Yeah. Yeah. 
Fife has a proud defence heritage. And in my constituency of Dunfermline and Dollar, that continues with the dockyard at Recife constructing Type 31 frigates for the Royal Navy, as long as, along with the local supply chain of local SMEs. So will the Prime Minister ensure the Strategic Defence Review team visits areas of, areas of strategic importance such as Fife so they can engage fully with the local supply chain and ensure the SDSR supports, Britain, supports Britain's security as well as local economies? Prime Minister. Well, I thank him for that question and for championing his constituency, including the work at Rothside Dockyard. The Strategic Defence Review will ensure that defence is central both to security and to economic growth and prosperity. The review will consult widely, including across the devolved nations, and I know the reviewers recognise the strategic importance of constituencies like his. And I will ensure that he gets the chance to meet the relevant minister to discuss the particular issues in his constituency. Dr Neil Hudson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> The previous Conservative Government committed to a rebuild of Whips Cross Hospital, the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Harlow, and the establishment, and the establishment of a new community. Oh, oh. Yeah, just sit down a minute. Look, I'm determined to hear this question. I don't expect the front bench to be shouting me down, and it won't happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The previous Conservative Government. Trying to join in again. Thank you, Go Mr. Speaker. The previous Conservative Government committed to a rebuild of Whips Cross Hospital, yep. the Princess Alexandra yep. Hospital right. in Harlow, and the establishment of a new community diagnostic centre at yep. St Margaret's Hospital in Epping. Will the new Labour Government honour these commitments and mm. progress these projects in full, mm. which are so vital to improving the health services needed by my constituents of Epping Forest? And if it helps the Prime Minister at all with his answer, these services will also help some of the constituents of his health secretary mm. just next door in Ilford North. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, well, look, he's right to champion the hospitals in his constituency, quite right to do so. The problem with what the last government promised was this. They promised 40 new hospitals. Yeah, yeah. The problem is there weren't 40, they weren't new, and many of them weren't hospitals. So we need to review uh, what we can do and put it on a sustainable, deliverable basis. But we will, and he's right to champion those in his constituency. And Lise Bidgley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, I met my constituent, Cheryl Corbell, mother of Olivia Pratt Corbell, the nine-year-old tragically murdered in 2022. Cheryl is campaigning for Olivia's law, which would compel convicted criminals to attend court and face the judge and receive their sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will my right honourable friend commit to supporting Olivia's law and meet Cheryl to discuss how we can move this forward without delay? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, in the King's speech, we confirmed that we intend to introduce legislation this session so courts have the power to order the most serious offenders to attend their sentencing hearings. This is really important, uh, and I know it's felt across the House, because to deprive victims and their families uh, of seeing the sentencing exercise is to deprive them of justice. I, I will meet Cheryl. I have already met Cheryl. Um, and gave her the commitment last August that we would do this, and I repeat it again today, and I would just pay tribute to the campaign that she has led. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If the Prime Minister was a pensioner earning 11350 this year and receiving no winter fuel payment, what would he prioritise this Christmas? Heating or eating? Ooh. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker. We have to be clear why this decision is being made. A £22 billion black hole. And the previous government would walk past these tough decisions, pretend it wasn't there, put it in the long grass. We're not prepared to do that. Because we're taking tough decisions, we can commit to the triple lock, and that means that the state pension will increase by more than any loss of the winter payment allowance. But I would just say this. The biggest impact on pensioners in recent years was when they lost control of inflation, when they allowed energy prices to go through the roof, and we went through a cost of living crisis. We are stabilising the economy to make sure pensioners never, ever have to live through that again. Mark Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Annabelle is five years old and lives in my constituency. She has high-risk neuroblastoma. Annabelle has endured 15 months of chemotherapy, high-dose chemotherapy, stem cell harvest, proton therapy, immunotherapy, hair loss, nasal feeding. Now she urgently needs the drug DFMO not yet available in the UK. It must be administered within 90 days of the end of immunotherapy. 91 days is too late. Will the Prime Minister please meet with Annabel's parents to discuss the life-saving care that she needs? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, can I pay tribute to Annabel for her incredible bravery um, and understand how important it is that cancer patients are able to benefit from rapid access to effective new treatments? The manufacturers of this drug um, have applied for a UK licence through Project Orbis, which allows the rapid review and approval of new cancer treatments, um, and we'll ensure uh, that that process is completed as quickly as possible. And we'll, I will also ensure that the Health Minister does set up the meeting that he's asked for. Dame Harriet Ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that socialism was about taxing those with the broadest shoulders oh, yeah. in order to help the most vulnerable. But it appears that Starmer socialism yeah. involves scaring those with the broadest shoulders out Shocking. of the country by taking away the winter fuel allowance Shocking. of frail 90-year-olds yeah. yeah. living in drafty yeah. homes. Will the Prime Minister apologise yeah. to my yeah. shivering constituents yeah. for his personal choice yeah. Yeah. and you. will he reverse this chilling decision? Yeah. My choice is to stabilise the economy after 14 years of failure. And I'll tell you for why. Because when a government loses control of the economy, it's working people who pay the price. And I will not let that happen under a Labour government. Yeah. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. More than half of people with pancreatic cancer die within three months of diagnosis, and seven in ten people never even receive treatment. Every two minutes in the UK, someone is diagnosed with cancer. But for those diagnosed with the least survivable cancer, time has too often already run out. Yep. I'm really proud of the Labour government's commitment to our NHS, but will the Prime Minister now commit to reviewing a long-term cancer strategy so we can improve diagnosis and treatment rates in this country? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I, I thank her for raising this important issue, and it's obviously the second time it's been raised in this session. I'll have a lot more to say uh, tomorrow when I deal with Lord Darcy's uh, report. I pay tribute to her tireless campaigning particularly in relation to pancreatic um, cancer. Cancer patients uh, have been failed by the last government, waiting far too long for diagnosis and treatment. Um, we'll get the NHS uh, catching cancer on time, diagnosing it earlier and treating it faster so more patients survive this horrible set of diseases. Louis Fletch. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Following Labour's disgraceful political decision to scrap winter fuel payments with little notice to millions of pensioners, will the Prime Minister today rule out scrapping concessionary travel fares and council tax discounts, which also help millions of pensioners across the UK? Yes or no? Prime Minister. As he, as he knows very well, uh, I'm not going to preempt the budget. It will all be set out in report. You're in that whistle. Um, can, I pass on my, can I pass on the heartfelt thanks on behalf of the Bolton Council of Mosques, who greatly appreciated the dedication and leadership that the Prime Minister showed during the recent riots over the summer? Yeah. Does my right honourable friend agree with me on the importance of supporting interfaith and community groups who play a vital role in bringing people together? Yeah. 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 Minister. Well, I thank her for raising that. Uh, and we owe an incredible debt of gratitude to our police for their courage in dealing with the recent disorders. And we took action to ensure they had the resources and powers they needed to tackle violence and restore order to our streets. We also, Mr Speaker, provided additional security for mosques, ensuring freedom of worship and protection from racist threats. And in the aftermath, we saw communities who really represent Britain coming forward, led by faith groups and community organisations. They showed that unity and demonstrated our values of tolerance and of respect. Yeah. And Davies. 
Jolch Llefarydd. Denmark has been undergrounding its electricity cables since 2008, building infrastructure and maintaining responsible stewardship of the countryside. The Welsh Labour Government's policy is for all new power lines to be placed underground where possible. The UK Labour Government favours overhead pylons. Why is his government opposing Welsh colleagues in Wales? Yeah. Yeah. We are absolutely committed to the transition to renewable energy. The reason for that is because it gives us energy independence, it lowers the bills and, of course, the next generation of jobs are tied up with it. We have to do it in a cost-effective way, and we will make those decisions in the cost-effective way. Jessica Moore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The UK steel industry needs a serious government which works in partnership with both businesses and trade unions to secure a transition that is both right for the workforce and delivers economic growth in Wales. We know that deindustrialisation can be devastating to communities, so can the Prime Minister tell me how the government is safeguarding jobs and securing the future of steelmaking future, um, communities like ours for generations to come? Yeah. Prime Minister. We are taking every step we can in relation to the steel industry because it is vital uh, that we give it the support uh, that it needs. We need steel in this country, we need steel made in this country, and our plans and our missions mean we are going to need more steel, not less. And It is the duty of the government to ensure jobs and communities and people are not ignored in the transition and that jobs are protected. And Mr Speaker, I can say the Business Secretary will provide an update to the House uh, this afternoon. Only Glover. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oxfordshire has seen a huge amount of population growth in recent years without the infrastructure to match. A new railway station on the Great Western Main Line uh, between Didcot and Swindon, would, uh, Grove and Wantage, would help to reduce traffic and improve access to both Oxford and London. Does the Prime Minister support investment in our railway, and would he meet with me to hear the case for a new railway station at Grove and Wantage? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for raising this important issue, obviously very important for his constituents. And we are committed to putting passengers at the heart of our railways. Great British Railways will work closely with regional government, mayors, operators and passenger groups to ensure rail investment meets the needs of communities. And I will ensure that he gets the meeting that he wants with a relevant minister to discuss the issues in his constituency. That Nigel Farage's debut, therefore, the in Prime Minister's chair. questions was as controversial as one might expect. His question, laden with the far-right trope about two-tier policing and the justice system, drew immediate scorn from MPs across the House. His insinuation that white people are being disproportionately punished while violent rioters and those with hateful online rhetoric from different countries are let off was swiftly met with cries of shame in the Commons. Keir Starmer wisely sidestepped Farage's inflammatory rhetoric instead of seizing the moment to reiterate his, uh, um, his, his, his critic, his critique um, of the 22 billion. I'm going to do all of that again. Nigel Farage's debut at Prime Minister's Questions was as controversial as one might expect, but not as significant as he might have hoped. His question, laden with the far-right trope about two-tier policing and the justice system, drew immediate scorn from MPs across the House, and his insinuation that white people are being disproportionately punished while violent rioters from other countries and those with hateful online rhetoric are let off. This was swiftly met with cries of shame in the Commons. Kirstama wisely uh, chose to sidestep Farage's inflammatory rhetoric. Instead, he seized on the moment to reiterate his critique of the £20 billion deficit inherited from the previous government, uh, a refrain he has employed again and again and again in the, uh, in, in, in the session of Prime Minister's Questions. So he's getting into his stride. Uh, but I hope he doesn't completely give in to the Rishi Sunak approach to Prime Minister questions, which is simply to um, deliver a, a, a slogan uh, willy-nilly um, in response to any question. Farage's performance, while lauded by his very small coterie of supporters, um, solidifies his role as a polarising figure. 
He didn't speak very much in the European Parliament, but when he did, it was significant. He has spoken quite a bit so far in different forms in the Westminster Parliament. And while his supporters have posted his um, his uh, his words on Twitter and on GB News in in the Parliament itself, <laughs> they are dismissed rightly, rightly. So while lauded by his supporters, uh, he uh, and and solidifying his figure as a polarizing um, object, a polarizing member, um, perhaps he was signalling more of the same from the reform leader um, that, that, that he would continue to disrupt mainstream politics with an incendiary style. Well, not if he is ignored by the Prime Minister and by the people who he's asking questions of in the Labour Party. It's, it's going to be very difficult for him to stand up and make a statement. Um, and Starmer's avoidance of engaging with Farage's diverse, uh, divisive um, language may well serve Farage and the Labour Party well, may serve the Conservatives well, particularly as the Labour leader seeks to focus on the broader economic challenges facing the 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 country you know the fact of the matter is this began starmer uh, with these with these groans they left a 22 mil, billion black hole and they hid it from the obr richard hughes is absolutely clear it's the largest yearly overspend outside of the pandemic um you know uh so th this black hole is the, the the black hole of calcutta yeah uh that's the uh, that's the trope that Starmer is pushing. As I don't think that it's something that will survive much beyond the first year of this parliament. I think what will survive will be the slogan about broke Britain. But I hope that Starmer can move away from sloganising and get down to actually answering questions rather than ducking them. But in the case of Farage, you know, uh, duck away, duck away. Duck for apples because there's plenty to bite on and it's not going to be found in Farage's basket.